William Padilla Brown is a visionary educator, entrepreneur, and citizen scientist who's credited with popularizing the cultivation and use of cordyceps in the United States. Along with his incredible work with mushrooms, cannabis, and DNA analysis, he also runs a small business, Mycosymbiotics. I'm the founder of Mycosymbiotics. Mycosymbiotics is an environmental research business based in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania that I started in 2015. Since then, Will has relentlessly pursued his passion for science, decentralizing its impact and accessibility, and helping to usher in a new era of open source ethics and community. Here we have some of the tools of the trade. Over the summer, Will met with Norspor to shoot a how-to video on Cordyceps Militaris, following a recipe he's perfected over a number of years. You can find this video on our YouTube channel or by clicking this link. The following video is the entirety of a sit-down interview we did with Will, some of which didn't make it into the final cut. My name is William Padilla Brown. Um, I'm the founder of Mycosymbiotics. Mycosymbiotics is an environmental research business based in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania that I started in 2015. Um, after a psychedelic experience that I had where I came to the understanding that homeostasis can only be, be achieved via symbiosis with local systems via ecological and social. Um, so I made it um, one of my priorities to um, achieve some sort of balance with my local ecology and the community around me. Um, so I started to learn the plants and the mushrooms and things like that and then I started to learn the people and the culture and get engaged with um, all of those things. Um, and I found it very apparent uh, and valuable to collect uh, local native species of fungi um, and preserve them and work with them um, for food, for medicine. And now we're starting to see all sorts of other um, applications now that we get more uh, into the science of it. What was like your first interaction with cordyceps in particular? Uh, my first interaction with cordyceps was a bag of uh, Chinese cordyceps. Um, they're all stuffed in there. There's probably like a pound of dry cordyceps in there. Um, they smelled a little funny. They looked kind of like beat up. And uh, you know, we made tea with them and served them at um, the uh, 2015, which was the first ever Mycosymbiotics Mushroom and Arts Festival or Mycofest. Um, and uh, at the end, on the last day of Mycofest, the first one, uh, my buddy Charlie Aller, they, uh, he's co-founder of Mush Love Mushrooms in Virginia, um, he found a wild specimen in the woods of Cordyceps militaris growing on a Lepidiopteran host, um, a pupa, and uh, he gave it to me. Um, and I took it back to my lab and cultured it out, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> cool. And I guess maybe a little bit about, more about mycosymbiotics and like, and how like how that from that start point how your work with cordyceps has evolved um, all right, so when I started Mycosymbiotics, I didn't start it with any intention of working with cordyceps particularly. I just wanted to grow all sorts of mushrooms, um, but it wasn't a couple months after I started Mycosymbiotics that the cordyceps landed in my lap, and then we, or then I started expanding out on it. Um, so from the initial cultivation of it, um, it was just me and my buddy Ryan bouncing DMs back and forth about how we could figure it out and you know trying to translate some uh, Thai recipes and things like that, watching a lot of Asian YouTube videos. Um, then once I figured out how to cultivate it, I, uh, it wasn't too long before I released the Cordyceps Cultivation Handbook Volume 1. Um, it was around that time that I uh, spoke at the Telluride Mushroom Festival for the first time in 2016, um, and I spoke about Cordyceps Cultivation. Um, and then after that, I started the first commercial cordyceps uh, farm for publicly um, um, public cordyceps, commercial cordyceps farm um, in uh, North Carolina. And I say public because um, I, if there was one, they, they did not make themselves known. There's no information about them at all. Um, uh, but yeah, I started, I started that first one and then um, I transitioned more over into breeding and um, uh, now working with other laboratories for breeding for specific medicinal compounds and things like that. Cool. Maybe, can you talk a little bit about writing the Cordyceps Cultivation Handbook and maybe like the second, uh, the second volume as well? Cool. Um, so yeah, um, the first Cordyceps Cultivation Handbook, um, I wrote it because everybody was asking me a lot of questions about how to grow the mushrooms and I 
didn't want to keep answering everybody's questions online. Um, so I just wrote up basically what I did. I, I wrote all of what I did and then I just added like some extra stuff to make it more of like a book, like some recipes, what you could do with it and stuff like that. Um, and I did that in 2016 and released it in like January of 2017. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, after that, a bunch of people started growing cordyceps. And um, as I started to learn more science and get more involved with the cordyceps, um, and after I ran the commercial operation, I realized that what I wrote in the first book was so outdated, like as soon as I released it. Like it would, it would, it would help people to grow some cordyceps, but like we rapidly evolved. As soon as you release it to the public, everybody's like, what if you did it like this? Or what if you add this? Or like, if like you take, like, you know what I mean? So like open sourced it pretty much because the book was like $10. Um, and everybody rapidly evolved. And then I started the uh, Cordyceps Cultivation Group on Facebook where a lot of people were just back and forth exchanging ideas. Um, so I was able to refine my technique um, and learn a lot and then add additional science that I learned. Um, and I wrote volume two um, in 2018, 2019. Um, and that one's been a little bit of a hassle. I eventually released it for free on the internet because I couldn't keep it in print because I, uh, for my own ethical reasons, don't want to print overseas. Um, and that's the more affordable thing to do. So um, I haven't been able to keep it in print myself, but hopefully that changes moving into the future. Um, but um, I'll put up another link on mycosymbiotics.net, but the book's for free, the second volume's for free all over the internet at this point. Um, yeah. Super cool. Can you talk a little bit about sort of like the, I guess the, the Corseps cultivation page that you're talking about? Maybe just like the collaboration and bringing like sort of like citizen scientists together and, and sort of like, you know, kind of open sourcing a lot of this information. I just, it's so fascinating. Um, I started the Cordyceps Cultivation Group probably back in 2016 or 2017. I can't remember when I started it, um, but I started it just to create a place where where the intention was to talk about cordyceps. Um, I think that's helpful for individuals where people are just looking for a place to talk about something niche. Um, I find Facebook groups to be very helpful for that, um, and you know, encourage a lot more people to get involved with it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people on that group now, and there's other Cordyceps groups on Facebook and stuff now too. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think that it's important to encourage citizen science and, you know, um, public acts of citizen science. And uh, um, I don't know, I think I'm just a good representation as like a, as a high school dropout, like brown skinned person doing science is just like shows that it's a really approachable. Um, and the more people that are doing it, the more that we're going to uncover, the more research that we're going to find, and the more practical applications of science that we're going to find. Because right now, um, science for industry is science for industry. It's not science for humans. So a lot of the uses of, of science for industry aren't practical. We have a lot of very highly trained scientists operating on grant money to fund research for industries that are pretty much, you know, the ones that we don't like to buy from or the ones that are perpetuating suffering in the world. Um, so as more people start to get involved with science, the applications of science will all change um, to a more practical human humanitarian uh, type of science. Um, so I feel like I'm just, you know, helping to guide um, not even guide, I'm just helping people remember <laughs> in, 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 uh, by showing them the things that I remembered in myself. Um, yeah. I sort of have a follow-up question to that. Sure. I'm just curious, um, you know, you sort of mentioned you, you're basically self-taught in a lot of these things, that you're, you're doing all this, um, you know, reading and technical work, and I'm kind of curious just to, like how you approached learning all of those things and then maybe like what you would recommend to people that are in the same boat that like want to learn some of these maybe more intimidating aspects of science and, and how to go about doing that. All right, so how I learned science was by always focusing on the things that was most interesting to me. Um, I don't care about anything else. Then that if you if you're if you're thinking like, you know, William Petit Brown's doing molecular biology. That must be what I should do. That looks cool. It looks great. Um, if, if you're just doing it because of that and that's not what you're passionate about, then you're not going to succeed and you're not going to be able to learn it because you don't care. You're not invested in it. Um, so I, I really uh, encourage people to start their scientific journey by only 
learning about things that they're passionate about and in that way they'll be so passionate about that they will learn as much as they can about it. I mean, I don't know how many times somebody has gone to buy something new and watched hours and hours of YouTube videos about it before they bought it. I know everybody in this room has done that at least once. Um, so when you're passionate and you care about something, you can learn about it. It's, it's way easier to learn about it. Um, and then um, one of the things that I did is as I was learning about something, I always applied it. Um, so as soon as I started learning about mushroom cultivation on the internet or reading books about it, I had the spawn in my hands and I was doing it right away. Um, so there's another level to your learning experience where it's, um, it's going into the mind and then it's also being applied with the uh, memory of the body and things like that. Um, so I find that to be very um, helpful and it also like, um, it takes it from a theoretical point to like a tangible point where it's like, this is why I like, okay, I read this, but this is why I do this. Um, so, and I, and I do the pipette hand motion because I didn't understand half the stuff I was reading about DNA until I actually did it. Um, and uh, yeah, so by following the things I was passionate about, you know, I got into mushrooms and then I'm just like, well, you know, I wanna know about the DNA of the mushroom. So then I was in interested about the DNA stuff. So then I'm studying the DNA or like, oh, I wanna know about the extracts. So I got interested in the extracts. And like, honestly, when I was younger, I was just like, really interested in cannabis and like psychedelics and stuff that most teenagers are interested in, but it's so taboo that like your parents are like, no, and then society's like, no, and then like you probably get arrested if you, if you go beyond those two things. And then, and then that usually stops most people, but it didn't stop me. Then I kept going until I got arrested again and it still didn't stop me, you know what I mean? So like, then you get all the, the, the bountiful information that comes out of following your passions. If you can get through, you know, whatever hurdles might be, be there. Um, those were my own hurdles as a, as a young person. Those were the things that I was interested in, that was passionate in, that I, found, that I researched until I, feel, I felt I knew as, as much as I needed to know about them. And, and it was those understandings that translated over into everything else. It was my understandings about cannabis that helped me into urban agriculture. It was my understandings about psilocybin cultivation that allowed me to cultivate other mushrooms. Um, and it was because I was passionate about those things as a young person and I followed my interests that I was even able to take that information and translate it into something else. And that was my own personal journey. You might be interested in bugs. You might be interested in puddles of water. You might be interested in 3D printers or, or coding technology or video games or whatever. But if that's what you're interested in, follow that and learn about it until, you, until you're at the cutting edge of it and you're the one that's doing the thing that's coming next because everybody has the potential to do that. Yeah, super inspirational. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like. I don't know how to follow that. Be, yeah. <laughs> uh, bring it back to cordyceps. It feels like trying to follow it, but um, <laughs> in your experience, um, I guess like what what do you think with cordyceps and medicine, or like cordyceps and wellness, or like, can you speak a little bit like what where do you see like human interaction with cordyceps going? All right, so I think that a lot of organisms in the environment have these innate relationships with other organisms um, beyond like what it is that they're eating. Um, and uh, it's clear for me to see with truffles because they have that relationship with a mammal. Like they need a small mammal to dig them up, eat them, and then poop their spores out somewhere. So you can clearly tell that like this truffle is producing these compounds, it's making itself uh, aromatic, and it's also producing these um, cannabinoids that can induce adult neurogenesis that would give whatever small mammal an evolutionary advantage that's actually consuming them. So that you can see clearly like, oh, this organism ha is doing these things for this relationship. So I, I see in cordyceps that it has a very human connection. Um, it's like a little DNA mushroom. It produces nucleotide bases. It, it uh, acts on a cellular level. It produces uh, um, adenosine and then cordycepin, which is so similar to adenosine triphosphate that it can enter our cells and confuse our cells, cells and perform almost a similar function. Um, and uh, from my understanding, and you know, my understanding is still limited, and as, as everybody knows at this point, I, I don't have a collegiate background, so like some of my some of my knowledge may be askewed by information that I've discerned from the internet. So I try to, um, whenever I know that I might not know everything, just start off with that. Um, but I, from my understanding, I believe that cordyceps are here to help repair mutated DNA um, that we have sustained from living in a very toxic uh, environment. Um, a lot of us are exposed to environmental contaminants that are that mutate DNA, um, 
And because of that, we're seeing generation, or like the first couple generations of, of babies being born with diseases that usually old people have. Um, and or, I mean, there's children being born with diabetes. Like there's, it's, it's just clear as day that, that we're getting, starting to get sick. So um, we're, we're dealing with a mushroom that's capable of, of, of aiding with uh, mutated DNA. Um, and then it's an aphrodisiac, which encourages the user to, to share their DNA, which is then probably a little bit healthier than it was prior to them consuming the mushroom. Um, so I, I also think um, in its energetic benefits, it, it lends itself in an adaptogenic way to the way that we're utilizing our bodies right now in such high stress environments where people are just loaded on caffeine and have um, adrenal malfunction because we've just pushed ourselves to the edge of, of our own energetics that we're just consuming something else for energy all the time to keep functioning in this, whatever this is, the charade that we're playing that requires so much energy. Um, cordyceps lends itself very well to this and providing us energy on a cellular level that doesn't have that same crash like caffeine does. Um, so it gives itself, it, it lends itself in two desirable ways to humanity. As an aphrodisiac, whether or not you knew the science of the DNA or not, if you were a primitive human consuming that, you would want it again for that reason. Um, and then for the energy, if you were a primitive human without science, you would want it again for that reason. And also they can be found at high altitudes. I found um, cordyceps at some of the highest altitudes in North America, um, and they can increase the amount of oxygen that's in our blood. Um, so that's incredibly helpful when you're at high altitude. Um, because, and it's an incredibly helpful if you're athletic at a lower altitude e even. Um, um, or if you have, um, you know, maybe, uh, some sort of respiratory health issues, um, um, lupus or, or uh, no, that's not what I was looking for, the word I was looking for, um, I can't remember. So, so there was a holistic healthcare practitioner in Atlanta that utilized my cordyceps for treating somebody that had respiratory issues. I can't remember the name of the disease it was. Um, um, and also individuals with sickle cell uh, uh, issues. Um, they can get more oxygen into their body. So it's lending itself to humanity in a lot of ways that the, the body would recognize without the science that you would seek it out again for. Um, uh, so I think that it's encouraging this kind of uh, innate relationship with humanity. Um, and where I see it going in the future, um, there's research right now that is, you know, what I believe to be pretty cutting edge that shows um, two active compounds of cordyceps, militaris, cordycepin, and cordyman. Um, are capable of inhibiting HIV-1 reverse transcriptase. Um, for a natural product to be able to inhibit the HIV virus from replicating is, empower is incredibly powerful. Um, and I think that there's gonna be a lot more eyes looking at it. And I think that um, as we have more eyes looking at it and as we start to develop the analytical protocol for it, we're gonna start to discover a host of other compounds in it. Um, and uh, you know, I'm really excited to see where holistic medicine goes where we start to, when we start to realize that every single body is different and treat every body different instead of giving everybody the same pills and everybody the same vaccines um, and everybody the same dose for the same medicines when everybody is different. So like we need to, I think that as we start to navigate that, um, when we start to learn about ourselves and about our own genetics and our heredity and how these uh, compounds interact with different people, um, I, 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 I don't know, I can only imagine where, where it'll go, um, but I do, I have this feeling that cordyceps will be used for like um, um, sexual diseases and um, um, adrenal malfunction and just general um, uh, general day to day uh, energy function for for individuals that you know continue either continue living in this system or individuals that are like looking to be highly energetic in whatever system they're creating. Um. What about like, can you speak to any studies of course, like kind of bring it to like the broader scientific community and citizen science community, but like, like what's, what are other people looking at with cordyceps um, that you're aware of? And maybe how does that scientific approach differ between like folks in the US as you know, compared to like what's happening elsewhere in the world that you're aware of? Um. As far as cordyceps, I mean, right now, most people are looking at it for its energetic benefits. Um, I think some people are looking at it for its, you know, um, nucleobases for like molecular applications. Um, 
uh, its immunomodulatory effects. And, you know, cordycepin um, has the ability to inhibit some DNA replication and RNA replication. Um, and it's why we encourage the utilization at lower doses, but it's why it's effective with high, uh, fast replicating cells like cancer cells. Um, so I think that um, as we start to delve more into this world of molecular biology and understanding these things, and there are scientists that have you know way m like more um, in-depth un understandings of, of of what I'm talking about right now. But until that linguistic structure is more commonplace in the world, it's not going to be very beneficial. Um, but when when it gets to that point, I think that this mushroom will be um, more highlighted. Um, I think everybody's just stuck on the cordycepin energy and like aphrodisiac and like sports. Cordyceps is like a sports thing. Like everybody's like, that's where the research is going to go because there's so much money for sports right now. So it's like cordyceps sports right now. That's where the research is because that's where the money is. Um, but I think as more people start to understand its uh, its role um, as a molecular factory like a like a tool for molecular biology like a little organism industrial tool for producing molecular compounds um i think that uh it'll have all sorts of use in a, in a new world of, of a molecular industry um like we're, we're moving into a world of molecular industry um and i mean these are like I mean, they're, they're molecular factories. Like, we're, we, we have more macro fungi that are more, like, they're producing more larger compounds that we can utilize, but they're, like, cordyceps are producing molecular compounds. Um, and molecular, um, they're producing molecules. Like, interest, like, they're straight just, like, filled with, mo like, molecules that aren't even compounded yet. Um, so I think that's going to serve a lot of functions. But I don't know. Um, my... Uh, the world caught up to my cordyceps uh, interests as I became interested in other in other things, um, and that's just how trends work. You know, um, I'll always be on to something else by the time that people are asking me about what I was doing last. Um, so whatever's happening in the world of cordyceps right now, I might not be as up to date as somebody else that's interest that's in it right now because my interests are in other places. Where are your interests? Um, my interests are all in molecular biology right now. Uh, my interests are in nanopore sequencing, um, and pretty much that's where a lot of my attention lies, um, because I've pretty much already designed large-scale 40-year food forest systems that I'm going to implement in the north and southern hemispheres of the world, wherever it is that we get land over the next year, um, because that's where my attention is right now, is getting land and, and understanding nanopore sequencing. Um, everything else is already planned out. Um, so once we get on our land, like, I mean, I keep telling people, I was like, the, I got famous off the stuff I did with no money. Like, I'm about to have land, and I've been planning for years what I'm gonna do with it. And if people thought that this was impressive, like, wait till they see what we're gonna do next. So like, I'm already excited for that. But the nanopore thing is where my attention is, um, because I think it's one of the most advanced pieces of tools that humanity has ever produced. The ability to real-time DNA sequence something at an affordable price point is like insane. You can go into the forest as it's being deforested in the rainforest for capitalism and sequence all of these organisms that will literally go extinct tomorrow as the bulldozers come, like and have their full genomes. Like that's incredible information that we'll need to utilize as we build these systems back because we are of the generation that will end this capitalist nonsense. So the rainforest will come back, but they'll be missing a lot of pieces. And if we're lacking the information, then how are we supposed to recreate what was once there? Like we can put the trees back, but without the moving pieces, like it's not a full ecosystem. So um, I think it's really, really important to have this where it's not a million dollar DNA sequencer in a room where only people that have been trained for four to six years can use it and it still costs so much money to do. Like I can walk around with a DNA sequencer in my pocket and I train myself and spent only a couple thousand dollars in a year of my time to learn how to do it, and now I can train people how to do it in like a month. And you know, that's where my attention is right now. And, and I think, I know, because a lot of people keep asking me what I'm gonna do with it, and I'm just like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. I know it's so powerful that I need to know how to use it. So just like I said with mushrooms, how we're like, how now that I know about mushrooms, I can see other things that they can be used for. I don't know about the DNA technology, but I know how powerful it is that by the time that I can figure out how to use it, the applications that I'll be able to see with it are gonna be unlimited. Like my friend 
My friend Laura Boykin went out into Uganda and within one season was able to do DNA sequencing to tell these farmers which ones of their cassava plants to plant that would be resistant against the white fly pests that were killing all of the cassava plants when like some 70% of the world that's their main food crop, the main staple of their diet. So like hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people would have died and she went in there and real time sequenced and told them like these are the seeds that you need to plant right before the season for them to plant it. Like, and that's in the remote area, like where you have one to send, if you, like from where they were in Uganda to even send a DNA sample, which has to stay cold to, to a sequencer, one of those big million dollar sequencers would have taken days and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And she just did it right there. So like, that's just one application from something that somebody saw with the potential of this technology. And like, it's still new. Like the scientists that even make it are still trying to figure out how to use it. And they're about to give me stuff for free because I'm helping them figure out how to use it. And I've proven to them that I know what I'm doing. So that's where my attention's at right now. And then the rest of the stuff that, you know, will continue to come, you know. That's super cool. Can you talk a bit about hex cordyceps again? Um, the life cycle of cordyceps? All right. Um, I'm still learning the life cycle of cordyceps. Um, as, as the person that people recognize as the nation expert of, of cordyceps, I'm still learning the life cycle of cordyceps. And I'm sure my, my buddies, Ryan and Jeff, are still trying to figure it out as well to the extent that I am. And now that we have the DNA technology, it's gonna be a little bit easier because we don't even know the species of insects that they grow on in the United States. We've only identified like two of them. And so whenever I first started researching, it was like uh, 36 different species of insects that had been documented that they grow on. And then when I'm writing my book and I'm like, all right, which one of these do they grow in in the United States? So I looked through that whole list of insects, every single one of them, and only one of them is in North America. All of them are Asian insects. So I'm just like, whoever did this research only did it in Asia. And there's no documentation of how many insects that Cordyceps militaris grows on in North America. And, one, and so how can we even know its life cycle? Because in order to know its life cycle, we have to know the life cycle of the insects that they grow on. So I'm just like, I don't know. The only one I know is the oak worm moth. And like, that's the most, po that's the highest, um, the, mo the most common host that you'll find in Pennsylvania is the oak worm moth. Um, and if it weren't for cordyceps, we would lose large oak populations because of that. And that's what a, just a basic understanding. And we find them on four hosts regularly, most commonly the oak worm moth, but we find them on four hosts commonly in Pennsylvania. So what are those other three? What are, the, what are the life cycles of those other three? What do they eat? What are they doing, those other three bugs? Like, and where does the cordyceps come in contact with them? We do know that cordyceps militaris has two anamorphs, simplicillum and lacanicillum, which are common soil molds. And we believe that they morph into these soil molds because of how rare it might be for their two mating type compatible spores to land on a moving food source. Um, they change themselves into a soil mold and then when that moving food source buries itself to pupate, maybe that's when they come in contact with it. We don't know. When we bring them into the lab, sometimes there's little mites that crawl out of the bugs. If the bug body is damaged, I usually don't bring it into the lab. These little mites will crawl out of it. Maybe those mites are carrying the mycelium through the soil. We don't know. Whereas there's still so much to observe, I feel, like we're, I feel like we've been so reductionists as scientists, like this is the cordyceps life cycle. It eats a bug, it produces a spore, the spore germinates on a bug, and then there's a cycle. There's so many moving pieces. Like, they, I, I don't know, like I, I, I don't know. I just, you know, and I'm, I'm excited that I don't know because there, it gives me something to do. What about uh, some like history around cordyceps? So like, what do you know about uh, other other cultures, historical use, kind of broadly around the world? All right, so a lot of people think that the uh, history of cordyceps, a lot of people think that the history of cordyceps use started with um, the Tibetan cordyceps and the yak uh, herdsmen that were herding their yak through the Himalayas and every spring the yak would graze on the cordyceps and then the Tibetan uh, 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 herdsmen would try the cordyceps or they would store the cordyceps in the milk of the yak and it would create a yogurt and like um, they would use it and, and be so happy about the energetic benefits and, and the aphrodisiac benefits and it's been called Himalayan Viagra. Um, and utilized by empirical and royal families in Asia ever since its uh, the understanding of its discovery in, in the Himalayas and the Himalayan mountains. Um, but there is even further um, documentation, or even uh, um, more older documentation of cordyceps on cicadas uh, in Asia uh, from pictures. 
So before there is any historical documentation of the Tibetan cordyceps, somebody was drawing pictures of cicada cordyceps. And recorded history is new. Recorded history is very, very new. Um, almost all cultures, even until colonialism, still weren't recording their history with like writing books and stuff like that. They were like dancing around fires and singing for generations and that was the history. So like there isn't a lot of like, for a lot of human interaction, there isn't like a picture or a written document that says this is this and at this point in time in human history, we were having this interaction with it. Um, but uh, I, I, any human that's not distracted by a cell phone and distracted by working for somebody else that's had at least one or two generations of a, of a family in a solid setting with food and warm beds will be outside being an explorative scientist. Anyone, like any time in human history where anybody's been able to plop down and have at least two generations that's like, this is how we eat, this is where we drink from, those kids are then, all right, I know where to go for food, I know where to go for drink, let me explore my surroundings. It only takes two generations. So like, Anybody that's not distracted is probably going to see every organism in their environment at some point. So humans have to have found cordyceps time and time and time and time and time again. Um, so who knows? Um, maybe we'll uncover more written history, but limiting ourselves to written history is perpetuating a zombie system. I mean, I, start, I had a question from earlier that was kind of related in that, um, I guess I'm not really even sure what the, like, the distribution of militaris is. And, I mean, you kind of touched on it, like, when you started working on it in the U.S., was that, like, super, like, was it not very prevalent that people were working with militaris specifically in the U.S. at that point in time? And... Yeah, so kind of not so much necessarily the historical context, but even the more recent um, use with militaris versus other cordyceps. Um, cordyceps militaris is the most successful cordyceps because of how many different uh, host species that it grows on. Um, I think that's why it lends itself to being cultivated on other substrates so readily. Um, and it has the largest distribution of any known cordyceps. Um, it's on every continent. Um, and, we're, and I'm going to start doing the DNA, uh, um, the tree. I'm going to start doing the tree of cordyceps where um, my buddy Ryan now has uh, European cordyceps specimens at his lab in Michigan. Um, so I can take those samples, do their DNA, sample DNA of cordyceps in the United States, and then find their most recent uh, relative. Um, so I can start doing a tree like that and seeing like, you know, where did they start from and how did they get so far distributed? I mean, they're associated with bugs. Bugs get all over the place. I mean, you got to think like if anything that can get on that many beetles and that many butterflies and moths is going to go places because there's beetles in people's grains. There's, there's moths and butterflies in people's food storage that goes in ships, wooden ships across oceans. Like anywhere that humans go, there's bugs. So there's going to be cordyceps. Anywhere humans go, there's beetles, at least, at least. So there's going to be cordyceps that can follow. Um, because I mean, we're, we're now, I mean, seeing that they're highly adaptive too. Like we're watching, we're watching evolution happen right now. Like we're watching them learn how to like adapt to the food sources that are changing around them. So, I mean, and, and fungi are some of the fastest in evolution. We can train them in one lifetime to eat things that they never ate before. Um, so, um, very wide distribution. Uh, most of the cordyceps that we're seeing right now, we're getting from France, Spain, uh, England, like the United Kingdom, Ireland. Uh, uh, yeah, so like Northern Europe and the United Kingdom, we're getting a lot of cordyceps militaris from there. Um, and we're getting a lot of cordyceps militaris from um, the Northeast, like in mid-Atlantic states. Um, and it's distributed across the United States. Um, it's found, but very rarely, in uh, Oregon and Washington. Um, and the Cordyceps militaris is part of a complex, uh, which includes uh, Cordyceps pseudomilitaris, Cordyceps roseostromata, and Cordyceps cardinalis, which all macroscopically look identical. So people could be finding what they believe is Cordyceps militaris, um, but it's something else. Um, and there's also one that's yellow 
that was found in Oregon recently, um, which I would love to do the DNA on uh, if somebody finds it again. You know, um, it's really great now that we have social media because when somebody finds something, they could be like, I found this here at this time of year. So like, all right, well, at least we know that that's where it lives. We can go back there. Like we know that like it's plasm is there. Like it's, it's germ plasm. It's like, it's thing that makes more of it exist there. Whatever the basis of that organism, it's sperm and egg, whatever is there. Um, because it had a fruiting body there. So there's something of it that is perpetuating itself there. Um, uh, so yeah, we can go back and find it again, or at least try to. But now, now, I mean, now with the nanopore, now with the nanopore, I can do eDNA really quickly, environmental DNA. So I can find cryptic organisms. I can find organisms out of season by doing soil samples or water samples. I can find loose DNA just floating in, or like that's just in the dirt or in the water of organisms that's like maybe shed it off or like something ate it or something came in contact with it or it's just dormant in the ground. So like, we don't have to wait for the mushrooms to even fruit anymore to find them. And I think in these understandings, we're gonna reach a level where we can just like pretty much dig in the soil and get what we want out of it, even though it's not showing itself. Um, I, I mean, my, like the way I see the world is getting real crazy, man. Like, like it's like, I, I, I get, I say things that are too, that's like real radical for like a lot of heady scientists sometimes. And like, I just like try to let the public know beforehand that I'm always high. And like, I've done a lot of drugs, specifically psychedelics. So they just know beforehand that I'm spun out. I do, I do science with real data for all day for the real scientists, but then I say something that's just like far left field. Like I'll be talking about aliens or like about how like, you know, I, I've been working on this truffled vole theory about how like truffles have like induced like mammalian brains. And like, uh, that's a little radical for, for like regular scientists and it's emotional and there's like other, other aspects involved in it. So like, I don't wanna get people down too many crazy rabbit holes, but um, I, think, I think we're, gonna, we're getting into some really interesting like de-extinction technologies and things like that where um, soon, maybe in my kid's generation, we'll be able to like take DNA code and re-manifest re it. Um, but that's just like, I, I, I see the world different. I don't know. <laughs> I, I can picture that happening. I can, with, with, with the modern, with, with modern in, front, in front of me right now, I can see the patterns of that manifesting. Um, To move it a little bit towards uh, what we're going to show in the video, <laughs> the tutorial stuff, which, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like cordyceps, brrr, like cordyceps, like. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it got all tied into like, I don't know, the excitement, just like being passionate about stuff and exploring the world. I think that's I don't know, a good way to live. Um, when should you harvest Cordyceps. Can you talk about, maybe about the harvesting and then like someone doing this at home, like what can you do when you have like your, your cordyceps? Like what, what's, you know, like what's this, the interaction that comes with that? All right, so harvesting cordyceps is like a little nuanced. Um, you're gonna have to like do it a couple of times and know your strain because it's going to produce parathesium on the top of the stroma. Parathesium are technically the fruiting body and the stroma is like means of the fruiting body not being in the dirt. Like the str like the the little finger looking cordyceps thing that you see, there's bumps on the top of it. Those bumps are the fruits. The whole finger thing is just a fungal stretch of of fungal material for the fruiting bodies to be in the air. Um, so when those come out and they, those get mature, that's when it's ready to harvest. After those are mature, then it starts to die. So like you're looking for the little bumps on the top to get ripe. <laughs> which is like takes a while to know what you're looking at because um, they get swollen. It, it's almost like it's like uh, uh, cannabis in the wild won't get big fat buds. But when you like keep it in, in, in a nice environment and you're making sure animals aren't eating it and you give it the right nutrients and everything, then it gets big fat buds. When you grow the cordyceps in, door, in the wild, the, the parathesium are like dimp indented into the, in the mushroom. Like, but in the, like in the culture, in a, in a container, they come out, they extend out and they get fat. Like they get super fat. 
Um, and once they start to, once you visibly see them like rigid, like it looks like you could, like, they te like it looks textured, that's when you harvest it. Um, uh, and then dry it at a low temperature. Um, and, um, you know, you can make tea or, you know, we store them in like dark areas because light can degrade it. If you have your cordyceps in sunlight, it'll probably take like a week and it'll turn yellow. Like it'll beam, the, the like, orange will go away. Um, uh, so you can store them in ethanol um, for, you know, extracts or just for preservation. Um, you can store them in vinegar, you know, for extracts or just for preservation. Um, or you can dehydrate them um, and, you know, just store them in a container in a dark with silica packets. Um, and then make teas or foods or um, extracts or whatever. Do you know, sorry, just a follow up. The the sort of like um, the parathesia forming, is that associated with um, kind of the molecular potency? Do you know, is that in terms of, don't, don't know yet? I don't know. I mean, I, I, if you guys go, if anybody wants to go back on my IGTV, I have this one rant where I got real stoned in my lab and I started talking about parathesium as a fruit for like an hour. So if you want to listen to that rant, okay, maybe there right. might be some <laughs> gems in there. Yeah. But like, I don't know. I've been like trying to figure it out. Um, because in, in, uh, when I started growing cordyceps here and when me and Ryden started growing cordyceps, all the Thai people were like, wow, blah, like, like freaking out in our comments because theirs don't have parathesium. Like, like almost all the Chinese, Korean, Thai cultures are producing sterile stroma for whatever reason. It's just no parathesium. I don't know why. And it seems like it's still potent. I mean, they have the analytics, so I mean, like, if it wasn't potent, I'm sure they wouldn't be growing it, but it, it doesn't produce spores. Like, they have really weird ways of that they keep their cortisol. I don't, I, I, if I could understand what they were saying, maybe I could know better, but like, I just watched them do it. Like, I've seen them like harvest a fruit body and like throw it into liquid culture and then use that liquid culture to start more like, I'm just like, what is, why? Like, what are they doing? Like, I don't know at all. Yeah. I visited a quarter pharmacy. They have like super, super wild, yeah. super cool place. I would love to go check out something like that. Yeah. Um, I guess, so this is the last last question. Like, any final thoughts? Um, anything you want to like convey to people? You know, like if, if you want people to purchase the Cordyceps uh, Cultivation Handbook or your website or um, essentially like, anything that you would like to, to say. Um, I definitely encourage people to follow me on Instagram. That's where I post a lot of really cool information. That's Mycosymbio. Um, you can also check out Mycosymbiotics. Um, Mycofest every August, first weekend of August. It's our festival that we host. Um, it's coming up this year. I don't know if this video will be posted before then, but August 6th through the 8th um, in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. So it's usually in or around Pennsylvania, and it'll be going on every first weekend of August for the rest of the Padilla family's existence. Um, and uh, that's a lot of fun for people to get engaged with. Um, Mycosymbiotics.net has good information. Uh, Apex Grower on YouTube has a lot of good information. Um, and if anybody wants to support us monetarily, um, I'm on Patreon as Permaculture Poppy, or you can check the link in my bio on my Instagram just for general donations. All the links are down below. Let's grow. <laughs>